My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am out here with uh, Arm B, time warping, to the point where I'm about two days from my closest approach to a B-class asteroid, which you will see me rendezvousing with uh, in this episode. Also, what you'll be seeing if you take a look at Kerbal Alarm Clock is that the completion of the Columbia, which is my first space shuttle, um, you'll be seeing that completed in about a little more than a game day from now. Uh, you'll be seeing that in this particular episode as well. But before we get to any of that, um, I need to close that closest approach gap just a little bit more. I haven't done any burns with the RMB since uh, its first escape burn way back in low Kerbin orbit. And I ended up getting a close encounter which brought it down to around 12,000 kilometers. So I, I set up a maneuver node two days from my closest approach, uh, threw in some numbers. Now what I want to do is I want to just tweak those numbers a little bit further and see if I cannot bring down this gap a little more. It's still uh, quite a bit twitchy out here. Yeah, I still, I think I'm still a little bit too far away, but uh, let's, let's just get this done anyway. I do have a burn set up, so why don't we do it? So I'm going to dial back the time using precise node until the node is less than a minute away from the RMB's current location. Let's go down to 10 seconds here. 10 second jump downs. There we go. There we are. We're under 50 seconds now. All right, I'm going to be using the flight computer because I have about a half second delay here. So I just, I'm going to have it orient to the node first and I'm really watching my electric charge, paying close attention to that and I'm noticing that it's not dropping. So those solar, those solar panels are still getting enough exposure. I got to be really, really careful with that. I'll explain that in a second, but uh, I just want to show you there's an execute button built into the remote tech flight computer. Oh, geez, this is a really tiny. Okay, let's forget. I'm going to cancel the burn. This is a really tiny burn. So let's dial the thrust back a, a fair bit because, you know, it's, it's going to take next to nothing to perform this burn anyway. Okay, let's press execute again. Okay, burn's coming up in about almost 10 seconds. Yeah, I really have to watch electricity. I only have 15 units of electrical storage. Uh, available and that's because you might recall from my last episode that uh, my main battery shorted out. There goes our burn and once that shorted out I lost 1,000 kilojoules of electrical storage potential and now I'm down to only the battery that's in the probe body and as I maneuver this around, I'm putting it back on prograde because I know that that orients the solar panels very nicely. Um, if I lose electrical charge, I lose my signal, the probe goes dead, and I have no more control of it. And unless I happen to charge up again by luck, um, you know, that's, uh, that's going to be the end of this particular mission if this happens. So one of the things I'm going to have to be very, very conscious of is electrical power. If the solar panels are not charging, this thing drains in like 10 seconds. That's about it because that dish antenna draws a lot of power. Anyway, let's set up another node here. Uh, that took again a little bit of playing around. And what I'm doing at this point, it's, it's not particularly smart. I spartan up in a little bit, but right now I'm just kind of doing it more or less randomly, you know, adding a little bit of normal, seeing what effect that has on my closest approach distance, then trying a little bit of radial, seeing what effect that has, and just tweaking around more or less randomly without really thinking about it too much until I get to the point where I get frustrated and I just perform my next burn. <laughs> Yeah, and this, this one brought my closest approach down to around 5,600 kilometers. Uh, at this point, I realized that this sort of stabbing in the dark process really wasn't working too efficiently. So I time warped about another day into the future and uh, decided to use my head a little bit more. So I put the nav ball into target mode. And what I'm using is the custom settings in the flight computer to uh, orient the craft to be where I would normally want it to be in order to herd that uh, retrograde vector onto the target icon, which is what I would be doing if I was performing a rendezvous. Now I'm just doing a little bit more meticulously. And then I can use precise node 
to get the maneuver node on to roughly the location that my ship is in, and that should help me try and close in the gap. Now, by the way, the flight computer does come with a nice uh, target retrograde mode. I'll be using that a little bit later. I'm not using it right now. Right now I'm using the custom one because custom gives me the ability to control the roll. And controlling the roll means I can control the orientation of the solar panels, which of course is vital if I don't want this probe to go dead on me. Anyway, this ended up uh, leading to a burn, correction burn number three, uh, followed very shortly thereafter by a correction burn number four. And once I was done this one, I decided to time warp a few hours closer to my target. And that resulted in two more correction burns. So correction burn number five. And then finally correction burn number six. Yeah, it seems like a lot of work. It is a bit of a pain. But uh, the end result of that is in about six hours time, I'll be passing within three kilometers of asteroid YOI442. Yeah, I'm not going to get any closer than that out here. Oh, I'll set myself up an alarm. Okay, here. Uh, let's select the closest approach indicator here. And what I want to do is give myself one hour warning. Yeah, so we'll come back to this when we're one hour away from our closest approach and do our final rendezvous and hopefully a capture of an asteroid. But in the meantime, I believe my space shuttle is ready to go. And taking up the Columbia on her maiden voyage is Commander Tamley Kerman and First Officer Stella! And I'm just noticing for the first time that Stella and Tamley just might have the same texture. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how that happened. Maybe it's been that way all along and I just haven't noticed, but I think I'll get into the texture replacer and uh, adjust one of them so that they are a little bit different. But anyway, yes, this is the Columbia up for the first time, and uh, let's just talk a little bit about the mission. Uh, the mission is just going to be putting a payload into space. Uh, the payload is on its way to Minmus. It's an unmanned lander. I have a contract to uh, do some seismic scans at a few nearby locations on Minmus's surface and uh, this lander is on its way to do that and we'll talk about the lander in just a little bit but uh, I think right now the main thing here is the talking about the Columbia you saw me um, going through the design I spent a couple of episodes talking about space shuttle design so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that right now other than to mention that I'm still not hundred percent happy with this i'll say this is sent it, it, we get the job done we'll say that but it isn't it isn't the prettiest thing in the world the main thing that's changed since the last time you saw this was the uh, liquid fuel main liquid fuel booster which was made out of 1.875 meter parts from homegrown rockets last time and now is stock 2.5 meter parts with skipper engine on the bottom oh uh, yeah those boosters still I don't know why those separatrons aren't working. It certainly is annoying. It's oh, oh, lovely <laughs> little explosion back there. Oh, and a lot of debris. Somehow, I don't think I'm going to be getting full value upon the recovery of these boosters. <laughs> anyway, that's that's actually kind of a minor problem. The the, the bigger problem here is that uh, as we approach main engine cutoff. My launch script, uh, once it gets above 15 kilometers, all it does is it locks pitch to whatever the pitch of the prograde vector is going to be. But the problem here is, you can see how it does these little these little dips. That's because the thrust is unbalanced and then it corrects for itself. But there's too much thrust on the booster or not enough thrust on the orbiter, whichever way you want to think about it. And so the prograde vector keeps dipping down with each of the dips that the vessel is doing. And so the prograde vector is much, the pitch of the prograde vector is much lower than it should be. So this thing is too low in the atmosphere for really to be going on. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's dipping down pretty badly. Just wait, let's, let's reduce the thrust on that main engine. There we go, let it come back. Well, you get the idea of what the problem is. It's too low in the atmosphere for it to be going as fast as it's going right now. 
But regardless, it did get its apoapsis up to 80 kilometers when the main engine cut off, uh, right shortly before the point that the main parachute on the booster was ready to explode, if you take a look at the staging diagram over there to the left. But, uh, and you know, it got up to apoapsis and I was able to do the circularization and yeah, it wasn't the most efficient thing in the world and uh, didn't get the boost periapsis up as high as I would have liked before I had to get rid of the booster. But, you know, like I said, we did get the job done. And I think when I, when I was in testing, I was testing and I was seeing this as was happening, but I was just at the point where I was just laugh, screw it, it's good enough. <laughs> but I'll get back to this and tweak this a little bit more. But um, now that we're in a stable orbit, why don't we uh, take a look at our payload? Okay, so we'll open up the uh, cargo bay doors. And we'll get ready to release our payload. You can see it's just a little guy. Built it small. Small and light, but it actually packs a reasonable amount of Delta V. It should be able to land on Minmus and do a couple of suborbital hops without any trouble. Extend the antenna. We'll make sure that the reaction wheels are on on the probe body. Wait, wait, wait. Actually, just... Second thought, let's retract this antenna. Um, I've recently upgraded the probe bodies that they're supposed to have built in some short range antennas. So let's put that to the test. I should be able to still communicate with this probe with, uh, with the antenna down because I'm so close to the Columbia. So let's decouple this node. Yeah, this should work. A couple. There we go. And we will use RCS to sort of thrust downwards just a little bit to allow our payload to clear the docking bay. So there it is. Isn't he cute? I think he's cute. Let's see if we can open up this antenna here. Activate. No problem. So there we go. We got ourselves a functional little lander here. Scroll in. I think he's cute. Make sure that the solar panels are in a good spot. We'll turn the lights on. Uh, and we'll get back to this in just a little bit and send it on its way to Minmus. But I think our first job is going to be to get the Columbia back down to uh, the Kerbal Space Center. Um, because this thing is in an inclined orbit. I, I put it into an orbit of six with an inclination of six degrees so that it would match Minmus's orbit. So if I leave it up here for quite some time, um, the Kerbal Space Center won't end up being below where its orbit is. So uh, I want to the sooner I get it down, the better. So I'm going to open up the trajectories window and I like to go in and what I call a belly flop orientation where I enter the atmosphere with a pitch of 90 degrees. So we'll adjust our angle of attack to 90 degrees. And then it's just a matter of time warping over to the side of the planet opposite to the Kerbal Space Center and burning retrograde until the point that the uh, cross from the trajectories mod is right nearby the Kerbal Space Center. Right? That ought to do it. Now, according to Kerbal Engineer, my periapsis is just under 63 kilometers, and it's right above the Kerbal Space. That doesn't feel right. Uh, and if you recall from uh, my testing that I did a, few, a number of episodes ago of the orbiter, I was, in my two tests, I ended up going long of the Kerbal Space Center each time when I trusted the trajectories mod. So, uh, the heck, well, let, actually, let's just put this thing at full... Uh, going in prograde with an angle attack of zero and then burn until uh, that has the crosshairs on the Kerbal Space Center. Okay, so that has my periapsis above the Kerbal Space Center around 42 kilometers. That feels better. I'm going to have to thrust, bring that trajectory a little bit to the north. So I'm going to time warp to the point just before I enter into the atmosphere, burn a little bit north, and then I'm ready to... Uh, get this thing down and it was right around here approaching the coast of the continent that's to the west of the Kerbal Space Center that the continent that the Kerbal Space Center is on I mean this is a big continent I still have to cross then a bit of ocean then to get to the Kerbal Space Center 
Uh, maybe not tra trusting trajectories was a bad idea. I'm going to be coming way short of my target. So, uh, yep, forget the full belly flop. Um, I'm going to bring my pitch down to around 45 degrees. Now, the thing is, I don't want to go full prograde here. Um, remember that bringing down a space plane is all about controlling your vertical speed. You don't want your vertical speed to go down too quickly. It's also about controlling where your center of mass is. Uh, again, I talked about this a number of episodes ago when I was designing the orbiter. Multiple fuel cans so you can move fuel and the monoprop, not just liquid fuel and oxidizer, but also the monopropellant back and forth and uh, so that you can push that center of mass forward and then later when you're gliding you can adjust the center of mass again to give yourself a good balance on the plane so that you can maintain control of it all the way along. You can also see here uh, I do have some red temperature gauges. Uh, they're both on the bottom of the fuselage there. One of them is an external camera and the other one is that front landing gear. Uh, neither of which exploded, <laughs> which is nice, but uh, it would have been nice to be able to control my speed through the atmosphere a little better than I am, but uh, I don't have, somewhere along the line, I lost the air brakes on this thing. I don't know what happened, this thing should have air brakes, it does not have them, but either way, no problem. In fact, I probably wouldn't have used them anyway because I wanted to stretch out this glide as far as I can, and I didn't manage to clear the big continent to the west of the Kerbal Space Center and get myself well into the ocean as close as I can to the Kerbal Space Center. In fact, in this shot, you can actually just see that continent off on the horizon, and with a little bit of a boost from the engines, I do have well over 150 meters per second of LFO left, not to mention the monoprop, which I have a substantial amount left too. Um, I potentially could have got myself to that continent, but uh, frankly, ditching in the water was easier. Uh, you can also see that uh, I dang it struck again. I got another struck, stuck control surface. That right or starboard rudder is stuck. I completely ignored it. In fact, rudder control is not even important right now, so I didn't care. Um, I'm wondering if uh, heat management might be a little bit of a problem as to why I'm getting all of these uh, dang it issues. Uh, I got to start putting heat radiators, even on vessels like this, just to uh, concentrate the heat so the heat doesn't get into these small parts. I'm wondering if that's it. So I'm going to be adding a radiator to this thing amongst other tweaks, but uh, you know, ditching it in the water, no problem at all. So why don't we get ourselves back out to my little Minmus lander. And you have certainly seen transfers out to Minmus before, so we're just going to cut straight to the ejection burn right here. Um, one thing that was actually a little bit different from other trips to Minmus that I've made is that I did not put a dish antenna on this probe. I figure I got enough satellites in around Minmus to relay the signal that I should be able to control this thing once it is in Minmus' sphere of influence. Uh, and I can certainly control it as you can see when I'm in low orbit around Kerbin thanks to the communication satellites that I have. But uh, in between, <laughs> not so much. So I had to do the whole injection from here. No, um, no mid course correction burn or anything like that. But that turned out actually not to be such a big deal. I had to uh, add a little bit of positive normal to get my trajectory the way I want it. But um, because I was already in an orbit that the inclination, the plane of that orbit already pretty closely matched the plane of Mimnus's orbit, uh, that correction didn't end up, it only ended up adding I think 11 meters per second to this overall burn, so it wasn't uh, that big a deal. Oops, overcooked it. Uh, you can see I'm shooting for a polar orbit, so that'll allow me to, uh, that'll carry the orbit guaranteed over the landing site that I need, but uh, I do need to fix this. So we'll turn ourselves over to the retrograde vector and a few puffs ought to do it. <laughs> little, little tiny puffs. All right, that ought to do it. So uh, we'll be revisiting this several days from now. Obviously that's gonna be in a future episode because right now I got me an asteroid to wrangle. Okay, so that silly little burn just brought my closest approach down to well under a kilometer. So we'll get rid of that, and I'm going to put it on the retrograde target icon, because now stuff is getting real. Oh, wait, my batteries are going down. 
Forget it, put it back on custom. <laughs> that custom one is always my backup because I keep the roll at 90 degrees so it always ends up orienting the solar panels correctly. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so we're charging up again. I gotta keep an eye on that. Okay, so anyway, uh, now we are less than a day away from our encounter. Let's get the thrust up because now stuff's going to get real because uh, I got about a thousand meters per second of relative velocity to kill off and uh, I best do that. So I'm going to set myself up an alarm, get myself to within 30 minutes of my closest approach. And once there, what I'm just going to do, and now I want to kill velocity, so I'm going to give myself 500 meters per second of prograde. Be a little bit careful here. The asteroid is behind me, so I have to burn prograde. It's catching up to me, so I need to speed myself up uh, to match velocities with the asteroid. Remember, I am on target mode on the nav ball, so don't let that retrograde icon fool you. Uh, I need a prograde burn. So 500 meters per second of prograde. And then I'll play around with the normal and the radial to try and keep my closest approach indicators reasonably close together. This is why that previous burn was actually relatively silly, because there's no way I would have done that or kept that closest approach less than a kilometer and kill off my velocity at the same time. So I eventually just said, that the heck with it, uh, let's burn this baby. And you can see that this burn is over a minute long. This was the burn that killed off most of my relative velocity. And then once this was completed, I actually ended up completely losing those close encounter indicators, which typically happens with these big orbits. You just, you, once you get in close, the close encounter indicators are, are useless. They just disappear on you. So from here on in, I just gave up on them and started doing this like I would do just any kind of a rendezvous, like if I was in low curve in orbit by thinking about hurting that retrograde that target retrograde icon onto the target icon uh, just by doing burns uh, of course I'm using the flight computer I gave up on maneuver nodes I just started using just manual put on the thrust and turn off the thrust so again there's about a half second delay but that wasn't too big a deal to deal with none of these burns were particularly precise to have to make and of course with every one of these burns my encounter was getting closer and closer and like I said, it really isn't any different than any other kind of rendezvous. The only thing that really is different is it takes more patience on your part to sort of herd this in. So you do a little bit of a burn, time warp a bit, see what the retrograde icon is doing, set up again, burn again, keep going like that. The other thing you want to do is keep an eye on your distance to target and on your relative velocity. You don't want to have your relative velocity be really high when your distance to target is pretty small. And I'll admit, I'm probably more conservative than most. I mean, here my distance to target is just under 8 kilometers, and I bring my velocity down to below 50 meters per second. Uh, I, I probably can be a little, a little more ballsy than that. But, uh, you know, you do have time warp if you're starting to get a little bit bored and want to get it over with, and it, it really didn't take too long before that asteroid was in sight. Okay. Well, it just pretty much killed my velocity, so let's arm the claw. Rawr. There we go, and spin this guy around. So let's think about this. Okay, I need to add 180 degrees to my heading, so that's going to be 290 degrees, and instead of negative 15 degree pitch, it's positive 15 degree pitch. Let's see how that comes out. Okie dokie. I could also use the target and prograde button to do this but unfortunately that doesn't get the roll right let's get ourselves moving now i'm switched over to rcs and we'll get ourselves moving in the right direction i think i can adjust this get it right onto that target icon let's try 291 a heading of 16 or a pitch of 16 degrees let's see what that looks like well, I like the heading I think I just need to make the pitch a little bit better how about 17 degrees on the pitch and like I was saying I could use the uh, target and prograde buttons if I didn't have electricity issues um, but I am want to keep my roll at 90 degrees and doing this using the custom allows me to control the roll so that my panels are always fully exposed to the sun. One, 
Good thing about this is it looks like I'm going to be hitting the asteroid on the light side of the asteroid. I don't know what I would have been... Well, I know what I... It would have been a bit, much bigger pain if I was coming in on the dark side of the asteroid. And then you can also use lateral thrusts on the RCS to move that prograde vector around and get it right onto the target. And now all i got to do is ride this in. I do have some spotlights on this thing. But I'm not turning them on because of electricity. In fact, I got everything turned off except for what I absolutely have to have. And there is a half second delay between when I put in a command and when that command gets executed, which is not a big deal, but I would hate it to be much longer than this. Oh, just about there. And we've got it. Now you do want the center of thrust of your vessel to go as close as you can right through the center of mass of the asteroid or else you're going to have control issues. So you accomplish this by right clicking on the asteroid and selecting target center of mass. And then the claw has a pivot that allows you to rotate your vessel a little bit. So you free the pivot. And uh, this turned into a little bit of a pain because at first I tried it with the flight computer. Remember that if I tried it with SAS that um, it gets some oscillating happening and that becomes impossible to control. But the flight computer turned out to be a little wonky as well. So what I ended up doing was actually just keeping the SAS off, not using the flight computer, giving myself a little bit of a nudge in the direction that I wanted, and then right where I, when I had it in the right spot, I just locked the pivot again. <laughs> it came out close enough. Now you might recall from the episode in which I launched this thing that uh, this asteroid is actually on a collision course with Kerbin, so now it's time to try and adjust that. Now, the one direction I cannot burn is radially in or negatively radially. Uh, that's because that will put my craft onto the dark side of the asteroid. I won't be getting any solar over there. My batteries will drain in absolutely no time and this thing will be cooked. Thankfully, uh, the trajectory actually is going around Kerbin in a prograde direction, which means I don't need to burn radially in, I need to burn radially out, happily on the sunny side of the asteroid. So that was pretty fortuitous. And in fact, burn that was required turned out to be minuscule. Uh, I ended up setting up this 14 meter per second burn uh, that got the periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere and missing Kerbin's surface. I do want to do some aero braking. And most of that burn was in fact normal because... Uh, I know this feels a little bit backwards. I eventually want to get my inclination down to zero because I do need to get this asteroid over to the moon. That's what the contract is asking for. But to bring my inclination down, actually right now, I want to bring my inclination up into this crazy angle. Uh, this is so that the trajectory will cross the equatorial plane of Kerbin well away from Kerbin. This will make my eventual inclination correction burn that I'll have to do um, quite a lot cheaper. Uh, and I'm pretty feeling pretty optimistic actually about my situation as far as all of that goes. Um, after the burn was complete, I still had 876 meters per second left. That should be enough to do the orbital finagling I have to do. That should be enough to get my capture around the moon. But all of that's really a pipe dream because the toughest part of this mission is yet to come when this thing arrow breaks on the night side of Kerbin. But that's going to be nine days from now. Obviously in a future episode, and in the meantime, I thank you for watching, and hope to see you again next time.